So this is the thesis or the theme of my book, Flight of DTs. It takes up case studies from various parts of India because the examples are so many in each part. If I take up one particular region, then I can write a full book on that because the devastation was so much. And surprisingly, the evidence of the devotion of the bhaktas or the worshippers was also so much. You know, what has happened is that we have never cared to reconstruct the history. We all know that so many temples were destroyed. Sita Ram Goel wrote a book, two volume, Hindu temples, what happened to them. So he gave a list. But beyond that, we never try to understand the temple was destroyed. Is that the end of our story? It is important to remember and reconstruct this story because it will help in the regeneration of our civilization and the healing of the wounds of our wounded civilization. Uh, you see, uh, we assume that temple destruction began with the arrival of the Arabs and Turks in the medieval period. But actually, the history of iconoclasm, that is, destruction of murtis, began in Mecca in the 7th century. All the images that were there at Kaaba were thrown out and there was an injunction given that murti worship or image worship should not be tolerated at any cost. So when we talk about iconoclasm in the Indian subcontinent, we must remember that the history of iconoclasm begins in the 7th century in Mecca. Now, India's experience of iconoclasm has been long, sustained, and very painful. And there is no part of the subcontinent that escaped the fury of iconoclasm. And this was an experience that India had never experienced before. You see, the Arabs and Turks were not the first foreigners to come to India. All of us who are familiar with ancient Indian history know that parts of northwestern India in the ancient period were ruled by various foreign dynasties. But there was a difference between the foreign dynasties that ruled over parts of northwestern India and India's experience beginning in the 7th century. You see, the rulers who came from outside in the ancient period there is no evidence of any kind that they tried to impose their own belief system on the inhabitants of the country. In fact, all the evidence that we have, that is epigraphic evidence, numismatic evidence, archaeological evidence, that all, all shows that they embraced the spiritual traditions of the subcontinent. So, and India was never a closed door to foreigners. And in fact, that famous historian, Arab historian Al Biruni, he writes that, you know, in the ancient period, there were foreigners like Varamira. Varamira is venerated as a great science scholar in the ancient period. And he says that why would Indians not honor him? Because he was known for his intellect, his wisdom and his knowledge. So this tradition of India respecting knowledge from wherever it came, it is attested in the ancient period by this case of Varaha Mihira which has been also commented upon by al -Baruni. There were other rulers of the ancient period, like the Bactrian Greeks. The most important Bactrian Greek that we remember is Melinda or Menander. So he is immortalized in a sense in Pali play, the questions of King Melinda. So what did this King Melinda do? He traveled to parts of India and engaged in conversation about religious matters with the 
thought leaders of this society. And finally, he met a Buddhist scholar, Nag Sen. He debated with him and got convinced of the wisdom of what Nag Sen was saying and is supposed to have converted to Buddhism. There are so many examples in the ancient period. But since my talk is not on the ancient period, I made this point only to emphasize that India never had a closed door policy before the Arabs and Turks came. It welcomed people, it welcomed knowledge from all quarters. And the foreign people who ruled over parts of northwestern India, there is no record of them having imposed or tried to impose their value system on the people of the subcontinent. All right. Now, in the 7th century, beginning in the 7th century, this experience of India undergoes a dramatic change. And what is this change? This is the sustained, deliberate and brutal assault on our sacred heritage and sacred sites. And this assault actually doesn't stop even till the time of Aurangzeb. So that is such a long time from the 7th century to the reign of Aurangzeb. And beyond that, the last evidence that we have of an invader is Ahmad Shah Abdali in 1757. So you can imagine that this is such a long period spanning so many centuries. And North India, according to scholars, was virtually decimated. There was no sacred site or sacred temple left standing. All that we see in North India today is a work of the 18th century onwards. So now the first sustained experience that we had of iconoclasm was in Multan. Multan was famous throughout the subcontinent for its sun temple. And uh, the last eyewitness account that we have of the sun temple is by the Chinese uh, you know, traveler to India, Hyun Sang. Hyun Sang, he visited Multan and he visited many other parts of India and beyond. And he actually visited the Sun Temple. And he gives a very vivid description of the image that was housed in this temple. He says it is made of gold and it is loaded with jewels. And he said kings from all over India used to send their homage to this temple. And so many pilgrims would come to this temple throughout the year. Now. Then we know of the Arab attack, Muhammad bin Qasim. He, when he attacks Multan, he is told that the wealth of this city is derived from the Sun Temple. And the priests of the Sun Temple, you know, he goes to the Sun Temple, he uh, strings a piece of flesh around the neck of the deity to desecrate it. Uh, but uh, according to the accounts that we have, the priests and the people of the city, they saved the temple by agreeing to surrender one third of the revenues of that temple to the Arabs. So the image was desecrated, but the temple was not destroyed. All right. Then we have Al-Baruni. He says that in the ninth century, when another sect of Islam came to control Multan, they destroyed the temple. So the temple and the image, according to Al-Baruni, ceased to exist in the 9th century. But it is surprising that in the 11th century, we have an account of a Moroccan traveller. He comes to uh, Multan and he says that, you know, uh, the people, they worship a wooden image of the sun god. So this comes to my the topic of my book, Flight of Deities. When that golden image described by Hyun Sang is destroyed, according to an eyewitness account of the 12th century, Idrisi, who comes from Morocco, he says 
that the people are worshipping a wooden image of the sun god. And he says that whenever there is a threat of an invasion, of an army coming, the people run away with that wooden image. And when the threat is over, they come back with that image. After Al-Adrisi, we have a series of travellers who come to Multan and who all talk about this wooden image, which the people run away with whenever there is a threat to the temple or the image. And finally, since I don't want to spend all my time on Multan, in the time of Oranzi, we know that the temple and the image, they no longer exist. Because Aurangzeb is supposed to have ordered the destruction of whatever small shrine that the worshippers of the sun god had made. And that is the end of what we know about the sun temple. But the story doesn't end there. The last point that I want to make is that in the colonial period, British archaeologists excavated at that site. And you will be surprised to know that in the excavations, they found a stone image of the sun god, which is now in a museum in Britain. So this is the thesis or the theme of my book, Flight of Deities. It takes up case studies from various parts of India because the examples are so many in each part. If I take up one particular region, then I can write a full book on that because the devastation was so much. And surprisingly, the evidence of the devotion of the bhaktas or the worshippers was also so much. You know, what has happened is that we have never cared to reconstruct the history. We all know that so many temples were destroyed. Sita Ram Goel wrote a book, two volume, Hindu temples, what happened to them. So he gave a list. But beyond that, we never tried to understand the temple was destroyed. Is that the end of our story? It is important to remember and reconstruct this story because it will help in the regeneration of our civilization and the healing of the wounds of our wounded civilization. Because this story shows that we were not submissive. We didn't just give up our gods. We didn't abandon our gods. We fought till we could to remain true to our gods. And that is true for every temple. In Multan, I've given you the example. But this example, and the best part is that if we look, if we try to study, we will find so much evidence, contemporary evidence, eyewitness accounts of that period, which will help us to reconnect with our past and tell us how our ancestors were so committed to the spiritual sacred heritage of their motherland that they went to such extent, you know, when they had lost political power, they were not a rich people left at that time, but they didn't give up their gods. So this is something that is so heartening and so, you know, it's worthy of remembrance and paying homage to our ancestors and our heritage. Uh, you spoke about iconoclasm, how it started in the 3rd century itself. and 7th century. 7th uh, century. century, I'm sorry. And uh, yet in India, uh, the left historians and all maintain that even before the Turks came, the Hindu Rajas, they used to break te temples, they used to break the deities. And uh, uh, another theory that they said that uh, Mughals destroyed it only for the wealth, through plunder and all, it's nothing to do with Islam. So, I would like you, your comments on this. Yes, uh, this is a theory that has been advanced by Marxist historians, beginning with Professor Muhammad Habib of Aligarh Muslim University. And I think we need to understand why they advocated this theory. You see, that was the time when the freedom struggle was going on. That was the time when India was partitioned along religious lines. And it was also a time when a substantial section of the uh, Muslim population opted to stay behind in the Indian subcontinent. So when a substantial population has opted to stay behind 
and not migrate to the newly created country. These scholars thought that that issue of iconoclasm, they must offer an explanation. Because a substantial population has been left behind or has opted to remain behind, the ugly dimensions of the medieval period, they wanted to brush them away so that animosity or the feeling of hurt, you know, gets reduced. So they started this theory that Indians of the subcontinent were attacking rival the temples of rival kings and taking away the image. So what the Arabs and Turks did was nothing new. They were only following the practices of earlier Hindu kings. Now, this is a total falsehood which can be rejected by just a simple search for the instances of Hindu kings appropriating images. Now, the point that I make is that if Hindu kings appropriated the image in the kingdom of their rival, they never desecrated. They honored that image, brought it to their kingdom, constructed a temple in honor of that image and made sure that it was venerated and worshipped. Now, I'll just give you a couple of examples, if I may. Uh, the first image that, we, the first case that is recorded actually goes back to the, around the second century before common era. That relates to Orissa or Kaling. Now, this evidence is there in an inscription that survives to this day and it is called the Hathi Gumfa inscription. It is engraved on a cave in Orissa and that cave still stands and so does that inscription, though that inscription is not fully intact. It has been damaged in parts because it's more than 2000 years old. So there is this King Kharvel of Orissa, and in this inscription he writes that some time ago, a Nanda king had come to my kingdom and taken away a revered image, Kaling Jin. Now, Kaling Jin seems to indicate it was a, jinna, a Jain image of a priest, or I mean, of a Tirthankar who was probably from that region. Now, he writes in this inscription that I marched with my army into the palace of this Nanda king. And I'm proud to record that I brought back that image. So the point to note is that the Nanda king did not desecrate that image. And the king brought back that image. It shows a shared spiritual cultural heritage. Ma'am, does this... Uh mean that the difference between image appropriation and image destruction that you talk about? Yes, it's very different. There are two different things. So, image appropriation means that you are recognizing the power of the image that is in the hands of your rival. But you are both honoring that image. Now, I was giving you the example of Khajurao. Uh, Yasho Varman was the name of a king who constructed this temple. That temple is still there in Khajurao. Any of you can go and see it. The image that he instated in that temple, Vaikunt Vishnu, that image had changed hands through six rulers at least. From all parts of India, that image went from one ruler to another to another. None of those rulers thought of desecrating that image or harming it in any way. Each one revered it. And finally, when Yasho Varman got that image, he instated it in this temple, Lakshman temple that he built at Khajurao. The temple is still standing. I'll give you one more example. We've all heard of the Vijayanagar king, Krishna Devarai. Krishna Devarai, he uh, went to war with the king of Arisa. And when he won that battle, he took from that kingdom of Orissa a revered Krishna image, an image of Krishna. And he brought it back to Hampi 
and he instated that image in a Krishna temple. The Krishna temple still stands. The image is not there because Hampi itself was vandalized and desecrated. But how do we know he brought back that image? Because he put an inscription on the wall of that Krishna temple, which gives this full story. So I am saying that to equate these instances with mass desecration in the medieval period is the work of some historians who wrote in the immediate aftermath of partition. And after that, that theory has not been uh, corrected by subsequent left historians and some Western scholars. They've gone on perpetuating that myth or falsehood. Now, you know, we are talking about the difference between image appropriation and image desecration. Now, in Ghazni, that is the place from where Mahmud Ghaznavi came to India, uh, about 50 years back, an Italian archaeological team excavated at that site in Ghazni. And there, among the many things they found, was a marble statue bust of Brahma. Because obviously some pieces were taken back as, you know, museum, as artifacts or whatever. So this Brahma image that this Italian archaeological team found in the excavations 50 years ago, it was very surprising for them. They said the face, the nose has not been cut off or chopped off, but the face is absolutely flat. Uh, the eyes, ears, mouth, we cannot distinguish because the face has become flat, but it, the nose was not chopped off or the face was not desecrated deliberately. So how do we account for this? And they said the face had become flat because thousands of people entering a masjid had trod on this when entering. So you know when thousands of feet trample on an object, obviously that object becomes flattened. So the face was flat and they explained this. So this is just to highlight uh, the difference between appropriation and desecration. So ma'am, since we started from the Northeast, I would like to come to the Hindi belt. And uh, we have some of the most controversial cases over here. Uh, starting with the, like, uh, it was called the masjid e janmasthan And then when did the term Babri Masjid come into the British records? Okay. I'd like you to talk about this. Yeah. Uh, this is a case that has been done and dusted with because the Supreme Court, the Allahabad High Court, the Supreme Court have pronounced their judgments on this issue and the temple is also well on the way to construction. Uh, but since you've raised this, it's important for me to bring certain points to your viewers. You see, we believe that Babar destroyed a temple in 1528 and he built the masjid on top of that. But the Allahabad High Court and the Supreme Court asked the masjid party, please give us any evidence that you can to prove your presence at that site from 1528 to 1858. That is over 300 years. So over, for over 300 years, the Masjid party could not give any evidence of their presence there. That raises the question, was it a smash and grab affair that whoever destroyed the temple, Babar or whoever, they destroyed the temple, quickly erected a Masjid, denied the believers that site. But because perhaps there were not that many people who could perform namaz, the masjid perhaps was not used. But the fact is that we have no evidence of what happened to the masjid from 1528 till 1858. Now, why do I say 1858? 1858 is when the British judicial system begins to operate because the British have established control over that region after the 
Great Revolt of 1857. So in 1858, in the Faizabad District Court, we for the first time hear a Muslim voice. That Muslim voice is of the superintendent of Babri Masjid. Now he is filing a complaint at the Faizabad District Court saying that, you know, uh, so many uh, Nihang Sikhs have entered the masjid. They started Haban and Puja and they've written Ram Ram with koila, charcoal on the walls of the masjid. The interesting thing in the light of what you asked me is that he signs this petition to the British saying that I am the Mutawalli or the superintendent of Masjid e Janamsthan. So, you know, this itself is such a giveaway that no masjid in the world will be called Masjid e Janamsthan because no masjid has anything to do with the birthplace. You know, uh, so that means implicit in this was the recognition that it was the masjid built on the Janamsthan. After that, there is a whole lot of evidence that has been produced in the Allahabad High Court, upheld by the Supreme Court, talking about the validity of the claim of Ram Bhakt to that site. But I don't want to go that to that into the details. Since you asked Masjid e Janamstan, I want to say this was the name given by the superintendent of the masjid. He himself is saying that I am the superintendent of Masjid e Janamstan. And one more thing in this context that you know, in uh, the year 1600, Akbar had given six bighas of land to Hanuman Tila. Hanuman Tila, we know, is near the Janamstan. And that uh, grant had to be renewed about a hundred years later. So, a hundred years later, the then ruling Mughal emperor, he examines the documents of Hanuman Tila and he says these documents are genuine and I renew the grant made by Emperor Akbar. So when he gives this order, the order can never be verbal. Na? It has to be written. You know, because Mughal Raj was also always called Kagzi Raj. Everything had to be written. So the scribe, who writes down this Mughal order of the emperor saying that we renew six bigas of land to Hanuman Tila, he signs off also in a very interesting way. He says, I am the scribe putting this Mughal order into writing and I am writing from the Janam Sthan of Ram. So, you know, it is very interesting that the Persian accounts also Acknowledge that this is the birthplace, Janamsthan. The only thing is that till the till the uh, controversy assumed its present form, that is in the mid 20th century, when left historians got into the debate and falsified everything they think that they could, all the documents that are available in Persian, Urdu, they were all unanimous in referring to this as the place of a Janamsthan temple. The flight of Srinathji from Govardhan to Mewar, they say it took more than four years and it took a long route to go there. So like uh, from destruction, we come to the flight of deities now. Yes, I would like yes. you to talk about that. Uh, you see, uh, the flight of deities on a mass scale begins with Aurangzeb's order of 1669. In 1669, Aurangzeb gives an order for the destruction of temples. Now, there is a mass flight of the deities because, you know, the temples had become were huge structures. There was no way that an ordinary priest or ordinary devotees could protect that temple. They could protect what was most sacred to them in the temple, that was the image. So, in 1669, when Aurangzeb gives orders for the destruction of temples, we have well-documented cases of mass flight 
of deities from Mathura, Vrindavan, Braj area. And what was the place that they could go to immediately? They could go to Rajasthan because Rajasthan was not an area where the Mughal forces could immediately enter given the terrain of that area. And most Rajput rulers were sympathetic to these deities because many of these temples had been constructed by Rajput rulers. So one of these temples, you're talking about Sri Nathji. Now I have to give you some background history of Sri Nathji. You know, uh, it's a very, very interesting uh, history that the image of Sri Nathji the full name is Sri Govardhan Nathji. And this image was supposed to have actually been buried at some place. Why was it buried? Perhaps in an earlier attack, the devotees buried that image. Now, the thing is that uh, when a leader was in the Jharkhand area, Sri Govardhan Nathji came to him in a dream and said, go to Braj. My Murti is there. Find that image and resume the worship. So that image is found and the worship begins. So when Aurangzeb's order of 1669 comes, then the devotees run away with that image. That image of Sri Govardhan Nathji is now popularly known as Sri Nathji. Now, where do they run with the image? Can you imagine the courage of the priests and the devotees that for two years they hide the image in a house in Agra? which is so close to the Mughal capital. So for two years, they hide the image in the house of a devotee in Agra. And more astounding, we have record of three or four Hindu kings actually quietly visiting that house and paying homage to Sri Nathji. Now, when things, when they feel confident of moving out, they take the image to Kota, to Kishangar, and they're trying to, you know, escape with the image intact. So that journey of that image has been chronicled in an account written in Rajasthani dialect, which has recently been translated into English, which records that from here, it went here, it went here, it went here. And then they said, we will finally take it to Udaipur. Because, you know, Mewad had the history of resisting the Mughals. And Mewad was not so easy to uh, access. So they said, we will take it to Udaipur because the Rana will protect us and the Mughal armies cannot reach. And the Rana actually offered a large body of troops to protect that image when the image was entering Rajasthan. But 40 kilometers before that image reached Udaipur, the cart in which the image was traveling got stuck in the mud. And the priest said that means that the God wants to stay here. So they constructed a small a makeshift temple. And later, the shrine that we see today, the Sri Nathji temple at Nathdwarka. And since we're discussing this particular uh, Sampradaya, uh, there were nine important images in this Sampradaya. But apart from Sri Nathji, Sri Nathji was three-fifths human height. The other images were a few centimeters in height, that's all. And when the attacks began in the time of Aurangzeb, these images were concealed in the turbans of temple servants. Because the images were a few centimeters tall. And uh, in Rajasthan, that uh, tradition of wearing huge turbans is well known. So many of these small images were hidden in the 
turbans of temple priests. Can you imagine that era? It's so difficult to visualize that people were ready to risk their lives to protect their deities. And so, you know, uh, apart from these uh, images, there are so many. Uh, there was a temple that was built by the devotees of Sri Chaitanya. So they also found the image. And then when Aurangzeb's orders come, they also run away with that image. It's from 1669 till 1739, I think. That image took that much time to reach Jaipur, where you can still find it instated and worshipped in a temple there. So, I mean, it is so difficult to imagine that this is the way we sacrificed. You know, I mean, imagine a person who's running away with the image. He has no regular income. He we don't even know how they survived for decades and decades, always on the run, escaping Mughal troops and Mughal armies. So this kind of dedication to our heritage is something that we should, re we should recall and, you know, pay our tribute to our ancestors. Ma'am, uh, like, you, this, this is so touching, so touching that they hid it. Uh, the pratha or the practice of doing bhajan and puja and havan at home, yes. does it also come from this era? Uh, it's a very interesting question. I can, uh, very interesting question, I can only offer a hypothesis. Uh, you see, even today, Hinduism is not a centralized religion. I can be a very devout Hindu and not go to the temple. Because I am allowed to have my deity at home and worship my deity myself. So according to some scholars, one reason why Hinduism survived the mass destruction of the temples was the decentralized nature. You could be a Hindu without actually going to a temple. So this is very, very important. But there is a related thing. When you worship at home a deity, then actually you are surrendering the public space. Because the temples were huge structures, they were occupying prominent places. So that means when you withdraw from that public space, you are confining your deity to your home or to a small shrine somewhere. So decentralized nature of Hinduism did help Hinduism to survive, but actually, in effect, according to some scholars, Hinduism surrendered that public space. Now, the importance of Leela's, Ram Leela and Krishna Leela, becomes very important for two reasons. One is that why were Leela's, Ram Leela or Krishna Leela, why did they become important in the medieval period? Because it was a very fantastic way of meeting the challenge of image worship. You cannot worship the image in a public space. So you do away with that image. Who takes the place of that image? A human being. So now you can be Sita. You don't need an image of Sita. You act as Sita. And the moment there is, if there's a threat, then you become yourself again. So this was such a fantastic response that, you know, if the image is under threat, you will not give up image worship, which shows how integral they were to our culture and civilization. But the human becomes the image. And the moment the threat comes, the human becomes human again. That is one part of it. Second part is that the leelas can never be conducted in a small space. A Ram leela or a Krishna leela cannot be enacted in the confines of a temple. 
it has to be in open space so that means it is an effort to reclaim that open public space also so it's a dual thing and you know uh, according to, i don't know whether it's true or not but tulsi das is supposed to have enacted uh, in the first uh, ram leela that was created so the importance of ram leelas and krishna leelas is to that you meet the threat to image worship by doing away with the image and substituting the human for the image and second a tentative way to reclaim public space that you have lost in banaras you all know that the ram leela is enacted over 30 days and that whole city becomes the setting for the ramayan so the uh, you know so it's not now confined to a temple it's a whole space public space that you had surrendered that you are uh, trying to reclaim the history of what i can say hinduism for want of a better word or the indian spiritual tradition is very complicated very complex but very very fascinating the hindus or the people of the subcontinent they were never passive to the attacks on them and on on their heritage they devised various means innovative means constantly devising various strategies to meet the threat rc majumdar and uh, there were other historians also at the time after independence uh, but they were not given equal uh, amount of importance by the then government but uh, i had a i had a question that even today uh, like we see there are three textbooks in class 12 ancient medieval and modern but the government has not changed uh, any uh, uh, textbook like in atal bihari vajpayee government we saw change uh, in textbooks like professor makhan lal's book ancient india and uh, Uh, your book on medieval india but today also we are saying that the same pattern that yes. you go upsc you read irfan habib and bipan chandra yes. you, you read left historians you clear upsc upsc exams and so i had this question yes uh, it's a very uh, interesting question but a very painful question if i may say so uh, from the time that the left leading left historians like romila thapar satish chandra and bipin chandra when from the time they wrote their textbooks till today two groups of left historians have dominated history writing as you said uh, the non left group their books survived only for a year i was one of them so within a year our books were taken out uh, it's a very painful subject but uh we can only hope things improve uh with the new education policy but what they will be we cannot say but i just want to add one a uh, word and that is that actually uh social media has triumphed over left historians because you know supposing my book i can never imagine my book uh being in a university curriculum or something but it doesn't matter because through uh, talks like these i have uh, got so many people listening to me becoming aware of my book work that many people would never read my book so uh, i'm not particularly disheartened i think social media has broken the back of left historians but as you say textbooks remains a concern we cannot say for how long uh, it will remain a concern so ma'am there is a remark added by r karnik ji uh in view of uh, this history textbooks he says how about uh, ncert inserting a chapter on what happened to our temples keeping in mind the you know whatever has happened it's not possible at all it's not possible at all given the uh, you know climate and given the so many opponents of this whole theory it's not possible at all we have to see what the new textbooks will be like but inserting a chapter on this will create upheaval in the whole country the kailash temple at kanchi uh i remember reading that you know uh, when kanchipuram was invaded by uh, i think the 
Chukya rulers, if I'm not wrong. The there was an inscription which was left in the temple which said that you know the temple was not destroyed because it was so beautiful or something like that, and that became the uh, reason why you know a similar Virupaksha temple was uh, you know built in Patadakal, and you know the entire uh, architecture. I mean, it it became a you know a birthplace of uh, uh, experimentation in Indian architecture, Patadakal and Badami. So, what exactly is the is this particular inscription misinterpreted? This inscription is not misinterpreted at all. The king actually found the temple so beautiful that he took back the artisans who had built that temple, and he said, "I want a replica of that in my kingdom." So that again proves the point that it was shared spiritual traditions, shared aesthetics, etc. It's not a falsehood at all. It's very genuine. And in fact, you will uh, find this in any book on Patadakal. I have a question. I mean, uh, during the medieval times, uh, especially after Akbar, Rajputs formed a major component of the Mughal armed forces. And yet, you have people running from pillar to post to save these murtis. When in fact, Rajputs formed the, at least the majority of the army. I mean, there is some kind of disconnect here. what gives i i just don't know how to phrase this question but uh, clearly if these people are commanders even commanders in chief like uh, mirza raja jay singh yeah why is it that the people have to run around to save their deities uh, first of all the people had to run around and save their deities not in the reign of akbar but in the reign of aurangzeb now uh, you asked about the rajputs you see the rajputs were very clear that they struggled for 600 years to defend but finally they had to surrender and negotiate with the mughals now the rajputs realized what their position was in the mughal government uh, you may be surprised to note that an examination of akbar's nobility the numerical strength each and every official when we take that into account it was revealed that 70% of his nobles or the ruling class came from iran or turan that is iran or central asia and why did akbar want to change that nature of that nobility he was always facing revolts from the foreign nobility because they said we are as Uh, eminent as you are we come from more distinguished families than you come so akbar realized that you know 70% of the nobles all the weight is on one side and he must have some weight on the other side so he looked around and akbar realized that if he has to stay in power he has to put some weight on the other side of the scale so two groups who would never revolt against him one was the indian muslims because the foreign muslims would not follow them and the other was the rajputs so 15% representation he gave to indian muslims and 15% reservation he gave to rajputs now the rajputs were very clear that now they have a subordinate position and you will be surprised to note that no rajput ruler who was even a close friend of akbar like raja man singh they did not dare to construct a temple at a prominent place in any part of the mughal empire now in man singh was the governor of rohtas he got a huge piece of land to construct a grand temple but then better sense prevailed and he got a masjid constructed at that prominent place and in a temple at a less prominent place even in his home state man singh did not construct a temple on the main space on the main road which could be seen by people he constructed his temples in small gullies if you passed by you would not even notice that there is a temple over there so this was a reflection of the power equations that were very clear to the rajputs in the mughal empire it's not that they were allowed to do whatever they wanted they had to abide by the persian cultural traditions 
and the power equations. There are lots of people and groups these days who, without any compunction, resort to distorting truths and spreading propagandas. I worry that they might claim that our inscriptions across our historical historical monuments were doing the same. Do you think that's a legitimate concern? And what can we do to prevent them from further distorting and erasing our history from any tools you might have as a historian? I can talk about the inscriptions that I have used in all my books. Fortunately for me, all these inscriptions were found and deciphered well before history became such a contentious issue in modern India. All these inscriptions are listed and deciphered in the publications of the Archaeological Survey of India, Epigraphica Indica and Corpus Indicarum Inscriptionum. So these are by words of uh, intellectual honesty and academic rigor. And most of these inscriptions were found even before India became independent. So for the inscriptions that I have used in all my works, these, the authenticity of these inscriptions has never, never been questioned. I was reading Ishwari Prasad history when I was in fifth grade, from fifth to tenth, I just followed it. Then I lost interest. But after reading Ms. Jain's book, now I'm too old to do anything about it, but I'm reading all the books, telling the stories to my grandchildren who are in America and getting them every book I can find. Whether it is Miss Jens or her sisters or anybody else who's writing. Yeah, that's a great uh, job that you're doing, ma'am. Thanks so much. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, regarding uh, Mirza Raja Jai Singh, could you just elaborate what his status was and what the power equation was? Because he was clearly a very high commander in the Mughal forces. But, uh, what, uh, but what exactly uh, does this have to our question? No, no, but still the general topic. population is still scared of uh, iconoclasm and all that. I mean, could could uh, they not, could somebody like Mirza Raja Jai Singh not exert pressure on uh, Aurangzeb? I mean, when he was such a top commander and he uh, had helped he, him during the war of succession also. Yes, but uh, every Rajput ruler was very conscious of his heritage and in the circumstances tried to do as best as he could including Mirza Raja Jai Singh. So it's regarding the inscription of, you know, the Kanchi Kailashnath temple, which I was referring to. Uh, so what I was exactly uh, asking is, the fir- I mean, I remember reading that, you know, the first part of the in- inscription said that the temple in Kanchipuram was not destroyed or, or was spared because the Chalukya ruler was impressed by its uh, yes. you know, beauty. Yes. Yeah. So uh, when the, I mean, so does this mean that, you know, the concept of uh, destruction of temples to whatever minimal extent was present before Islamic uh, uh, invasions, was it a reality? Mm. And uh, just to add on to that, the concept of loot of the defeated kingdom, I understand definitely that, you know, the concept of loop did not involve, you know, desecration of any, uh, you know, religious places of worship. That was definitely the case. But how far was this concept of loot uh, prevalent or what is the extent of its prevalence and when did it actually start getting into the, uh, you know, Indian psych or, you know, in Indian history post Mahabharata period, I would say. I cannot uh, say when the concept of loot got ingrained in the Indian psychology, but uh, I think that's a part of warfare that, you know, uh, what do you, what, it's a follow up of the warfare, isn't it? It's a part of warfare. But desecration was never part of war. That's what I can say with certainty. Uh, yes, ma'am. I wanted to ask, like, uh, you know, we have spoken about all the famous, uh, you know, uh, places, uh, you know, where the, uh, uh, regarding the idols and whatever events that occurred. Uh, and some of them are in the mainstream media. Is there one particular thing that's close to your heart that you don't feel has gotten the national attention or rather the attention that it uh, deserves? One particular instance uh, based on all your whole compendium of research. No, but I think gradually uh, every site is getting its due. Uh, I don't think there's any one particular site which is not getting its due. Uh, Gradually, gradually every temple desecrated or destroyed 
is getting attention. Even that uh, Rudra Mahale, that whole temple, you know, that excavations over there showed shivlings in their original place. place you know, so uh, I think that uh, the only problem that I have is that people, more people, should become aware of our heritage and our culture and our temples, which is really not the case. Ma'am, I've just got two questions. Uh, one is I saw an image several years ago on Twitter about uh, an ancient structure in Koshambi. Uh, it had somewhat, it had an Islamic arch kind of a structure. And supposedly this structure was more than 2000 years ago. So my question is that what we call as Islamic arch, was that present in India before the Muslims came? That's number yes. one. Yes, to just answer that question. Yes, it was present. Now, archaeologists have done work and don't, don't remember the exact place where they have said that the arch was very much there. But it's correct what you're saying, that it was there before the coming of Islam. What happened to the temples in Delhi? Uh, you see, uh, we all know about the Qutub complex, that the 27 temples were destroyed over there. The excavations have shown that. Many of the images that were found there are now in the National Museum. But that is not the only site that was destroyed. You know, Yog Mayas, the Jain Temple. These are old sacred sites that the Hindus lost claim over, but they did not surrender that site. Yog Maya Temple, is a, that site is very, very old, as also the Jain Temple in Chandi Chowk. But I want to tell you something very interesting since you asked about Delhi. You see, when the British entered Delhi, then after some time, they did a survey of sacred structures in what we call Shah Jahanabad or Purani Delhi or Chandi Chowk. And they reasoned that Chandi Chowk was an area where the rich uh, Hindu, Jain merchants used to live who were supplying to the Mughal court was just across the street. So they did a survey and they found so many important mosques on all the prominent streets. But they could not find a single temple in Chandi Chowk area. And they were surprised that, you know, the jewelers, the traders, the goldsmiths, I mean, so many prosperous Hindu communities are living in Chandi Chowk and there is no temple. How is it possible? So, you will be surprised to know that they discovered that the houses of these Hindu Jain merchants, they had long boundary walls, tall boundary walls. And the boundary wall on the inside, there is the boundary wall has two parts, no? one outside, one inside. So the boundary wall inside, in the boundary wall, there were alas. Alas means small openings. You know, like in old houses, you have where you can put things. So those alas were where they had put images. There was no bell ringing in those temples. There was no conch shell. So out, just outside the wall, you would not even know that there's a temple inside. So imagine the temples that we saw in Delhi. 27 Jain temples and Hindu temples in the Qutub complex, all demolished. The statues have been found there. Many of them are in the National Museum. And from those huge structures, temples have become small openings in the boundary wall. That was that gives you an idea of the way that civilization was challenged, destroyed, diminished, humiliated. Let me put it this way. And then when the British period began, whatever we may say about the British period, they were not destroyers of Hindu temples. In fact, there is a father, Reverend Shering. Reverend Shering wrote at that time, and his book on Banaras is even available on the net because it's an old book. You can download it and read it. And he writes, it's amazing. What an impetus 
our rule has given to temple building so he is writing that the british rule has given an impetus to temple building everywhere i go i see hindus building temples small rulers big rulers common people so this temple revival the reconstruction of temples actually begins when the worst of mughal rule is over ma'am unfortunately maybe uh, a couple of years later they will again talk about the destruction of temples like how they are destroying these mud around the jagannath puri temple yes yes the demolition in building toilets yes yes, yes and what yes. happened in rajasthan day yes, before yes yes so we always have to be aware and alert about what is happening around us and this time there is no outrage there is no i mean yes. i think the hindus are half dead now yes uh, many people say that we have lost that sensitivity and even link with our past and they say that much of it is due to the history that we have been taught in schools uh, for the last 4 uh, 5 decades it has desensitized us to our past and in fact uh, you know inculcated a sense of guilt and shame in many of us so it's important to recall the past in all its you know determination to abide by our heritage it's difficult to imagine those people and uh, compare them with us today that's why i say it's very important to record this because now i agree with you so many of us have become desensitized and it doesn't matter to us uh, plus ma'am the uh, wrong understanding of spirituality yes i think owing to a lot of study of buddhism and even advaita i follow the path of advaita but you know you are happy to be in some odd white light in attaining your enlightenment only spiritually while everything around you is falling apart so that kind of cutting yourself off from the sansara uh, i am very new to the subject of, of indian history and culture i am being born and brought up abroad and very much into it now i am reading and i've heard about you and i'm going to uh, order some of your books and start reading and uh, i've got so much to ask that i don't feel you know that i don't know where yeah. to start yeah so but maybe uh, we'll meet you. up on, on another platform and I'm, yes. i really thoroughly enjoyed this thank you so much I, thank I you so on, much yeah. I, i do i think i i do um, um, uh, follow you on twitter as well so ma'am again yeah. social media vishal has typed his question hmm. that is hate for idols a kind of mental uh, disease and no. then he says islamophobia has got recognition has time has come to coin the term idol phobia at international levels like the un so that we are able to tackle these idol phobic people i just have one uh, short reply that it is not hate it is a religious injunction as i told you this story began in mecca in the 7th century and it is an injunction a religious obligation for all followers of the faith so there is no question of hate or anything it is obligatory on all people who are following this faith and last thing i want to say if it was not obligatory why were the bamyan buddhas blown up in the year 2000 nobody was worshiping them nobody was worshiping them they were just standing mute but they were blown up 